a moment of silence um, just to think about those people and let's keep them in our thoughts as we move through today's meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we need to start with approval of the agenda. And uh, after we uh, open a motion to approve the agenda, I'm gonna suggest modification to it. So let's open with a motion to approve the agenda. Mr. Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if I could, I'm down here, say a few words before we get too oh, far. Oh, please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, I, everybody, I'm Brad Mueller. I'm the Director of Planning and Development Services. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all for coming together as a joint group uh, with my colleague and friend, Allie Rhodes. Uh, you know, we are appreciative of the cooperative opportunity that this represents. Um, I, I know it's clear to everybody uh, the intent this evening, but uh, just for any public and kind of to give context to this, uh, we, we don't obviously see a lot of historic preservation districts, historic districts being proposed. And this is really an opportunity for the two boards to come together and learn from each other and, and uh, answer any questions and, and gain each other's perspective on things. Uh, we do understand and, and appreciate that there was some frustration um, by members of the public and and maybe others about the rescheduling of uh, this. We just wanted to make it clear that um, the date that was set for today was based on the availability of uh, making sure that we've got a quorum for both boards and also the fact that uh, historic districts are on a specific timeline under the code for us to uh, meet. And so when you when you put those two parameters together, uh, this was the date that, that landed. And I appreciate that staff worked very hard with all of you to to get that settled in. Uh, we also appreciate that the applicants uh, agreed to a tolling agreement that lengthened the amount of time for a review of the historic district. Uh, we had always had concerns at the very beginning that it was gonna be hard to fit all of uh, the joint efforts in, in the timeframe that we had, as well as the extensive outreach and coordination uh, to the multiple departments that are represented as interests uh, for the civic area and the broader public recognizing that um, much different than other types of historic district represents a, uh, an asset for the whole community. So uh, we appreciate that uh, extra time that the applicants were giving. Um, as you mentioned, Mr. Chair, this is uh, not a hearing, so there's not public uh, comment, uh, but it is re being recorded and we encourage people from the public to um, review that and, and recognize that it is a study session for information. Uh, Quasi-judicial hearings such as this will turn into with both the uh, Landmarks Board and the uh, City Council are ones where there is public testimony taken, uh, much like a uh, court proceeding, and those are the appropriate times to express opinions and provide testimony from the public. Um, so we would anticipate folks sharing that information from the community at those times uh, when those go forward. Uh, again, thank you for um, the acknowledgement this evening and I wish you all a, a great meeting and thank you again for your time and cooperation. And I, I don't know if Allie has anything to add. I, I don't, I think you covered it well. Thanks, Brad. Looking forward to everyone's input. Great, thank you very much. Okay, at this time, let's begin with approval of the agenda. So I'll accept a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. And a second. Thank you. Okay, um, I would like to propose an amendment to the agenda, and that is to ask uh, Parks and Recreation Director Ali Rhodes to give us a short briefing on the occurrences that uh, led to the woman's death beginning at the North Boulder Rec Center. And we would do that at the beginning of the Parks and Recreation portion of the, of the meeting. So starting right in front of item three on the agenda. Is there any discussion of this uh, motion? Okay. Um, is there a second to the amendment? Second. All in favor of the modifying the agenda, please say aye. Aye. Jason, are you still on there? I am, yeah. Aye, aye for me too. Great, thank you. Sorry, I can't be there in person. Oh, no problem. We understand you, you have a little illness. Thanks. 
Okay, great. So let's uh, start with item two now, the joint study session. So we'll start with a call to order of this joint study session, and I will turn it over to staff for, um, for the discussion. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Rosa, can you advance the slide? Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Christopher Johnson. I'm the Comprehensive Planning Manager uh, and uh, within Planning and Development Services, the Historic Preservation Program falls within our purview within Planning and Development Services. So that's why I'm here this evening. And also I will serve as a facilitator to the discussion after we have an opportunity to go through the presentation. Uh, I'm joined up here uh, at the dais this evening with Marcy Gerwing. She's Principal City Planner. She's the lead of our Historic Preservation Program. Shihomi Kuriagawa, uh, who is a senior landscape architect with uh, Boulder Parks and Recreation and is also the project manager for the Civic Area Phase 2 project. And then Lucas Markley, assistant city attorney with our city attorney's office, who is our liaison to the Landmarks Board. Uh, and we will all have a few slides for you uh, to walk through the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> So really the, the purpose of this meeting, and, and as Brad sort of alluded to, uh, tonight's joint study session uh, is not a public hearing. It, it is really an opportunity for us to share information with you and then to receive uh, comments and feedback and, and discussion. Uh, we will update you on the process and the sequence uh, and schedule for the proposed Civic Area Historic District um, activities that have occurred over the last six months or so, and then what we <clears throat> uh, anticipate going forward. We'll be asking for your uh, feedback on a draft design guideline framework, um, which we provided to you in the, in the staff memo, and we will present um, as well here this evening. And then finally, uh, we will ask for a review and comment of the cultural landscape uh, assessment process and the preliminary findings for Central Park that were also included in the packet in an executive summary. Uh, next slide. And I will pass it off to Lucas to just provide a little bit of detail about um, the role of each of the boards uh, in this in this meeting and also going forward. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Lucas Markley. I'm an assistant city attorney in the city attorney's office. I work with the Landmarks Board. Um, I attend all their meetings and I know many of our Parks and Rec uh, staff from working on different issues. Um, so I'm just gonna go over the roles a little bit. Um, this should be pretty quick and maybe some review for you all, hopefully. Um, so the duties of the city's boards and commissions are generally laid out in our Boulder Revised Code and in the city charter. Um, starting first with the Landmarks Board, their role with respect to historic um, districts or proposed historic districts is to make a rec recommendation to city council um, or not, depending on the results of uh, an upcoming hearing but to make a recommendation to city council as to whether a historic designation or historic district should be should move forward. Uh, and they also ultimately would adopt the design guidelines um, if a historic district is created. Um, the Parks and Rec Advisory Board doesn't have a, uh, a formal role, so the ordinances don't establish anything in, in particular with respect to historic districts, um, but uh, PRAB does have a role to make recommendations to city council uh, regarding the protection and maintenance of park lands, uh, which this district would in, in part include um, some of those lands. Um, so probably we'll have the opportunity at uh, a later meeting to discuss the merits of the proposal, the proposed district in more detail, um, and also participate in this joint study session tonight to, to give input to staff on the, on the proposed guideline framework. Um, planning board, they, they do have a specific role to report to city council on the land use implications of any uh, proposed districts. And then finally, city council, of course, has the, the, the obligation or the, the ability to actually decide whether or not a historic district um, will be created. Everyone else is just sort of making recommendations one way or, way, one way or another um, leading up to that point. So we can go to the next slide, please. I'm gonna talk a little bit in more detail about the Landmarks Board's uh, quasi-judicial role because it, it's a little more narrow and constrained than, um, um, than a lot of the roles that we sometimes have for boards and commissions. But uh, Boulder Revised Code Section 9115 uh, provides that the Landmarks Board needs to have a, a public quasi-judicial hearing before recommending to city council that they 
um, create a historic district. So that hearing is scheduled for February 7th, 2024. And if you go to the ne uh, next slide. So when, when the board, when any board is in a quasi-judicial role, uh, they have to make their decision based on the applicable law and the evidence and testimony that's presented at that quasi-judicial hearing. So based on all that information that they hear at that hearing, the Landmarks Board will then decide whether to recommend that City Council create this, the district. Um, in a quasi-judicial hearing, the board functions similarly, similarly to a judge. Um, so they're not to prejudge the issue or decide the issue before they actually hear all that evidence uh, that comes in at their, their actual hearing. Okay, next slide, please. So because uh, Landmarks Board has to make their decision based on the evidence that they hear at that hearing, um, Landmarks Board and PRAB at this meeting uh, should really focus on those design guidelines or the framework proposed for the design guidelines uh, as opposed to the merits of the decision. That is, should the district be created or not? What are the pluses and minuses of that? Um, should there be any, should the boundary be changed? I mean, that kind of thing will be um, discussed later. Um, as I think mentioned, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, PRAB will have the that ability to discuss those in more detail at their own meeting to then make a recommendation or provide input that could then be given to Landmarks Board at their February hearing. Um, so I think that just about covers what I was uh, going to present. I think we'll have to kind of see where the conversation goes a little bit. It's a little hard to say in advance what is, what is the exact dividing line between things that are relevant to the guidelines versus what's relevant to the decision that the Landmarks Board will have to make to recommend to City Council at their next hearing. Um, but I think uh, I think something we can navigate as we work through it tonight. So thank you. Thanks, Lucas. Uh, next slide, please, Rosa. Uh, I wanted to just introduce a couple of um, group agreements. And, and these are really, uh, you know, um, modified from a set of group agreements that we developed at the Landmarks Board uh, previously. And, and it really, it's just provides a framework, I think, for, for everybody, um, both staff and board members, to have a positive and, and productive conversation and discussion. So really quickly, you know, one speaker at a, at a, at a time, you know, please let each board member uh, speak when they're ready and without interruption. Be curious about lived experiences other than your own. So ask questions to, to dig further and, and to understand other people's perspectives. Share the air, so step forward with your contribution, but then stay, step back and make room for others to provide their input. Um, everybody has a role to play here in keeping comments uh, concise tonight and, and trying to keep us on time. We will attempt to do the same thing. Uh, share and listen to understand rather than to respond. So be open to the sharing of personal views and then be hard on issues and soft on people. So different perspectives are very welcome, uh, but disrespect is not. So next slide, please. And these discussion questions, I'm just putting them up here as a kind of a preview of what we'll come back to after the presentation, but there are things that you can keep in mind and they and they uh, align directly with the purpose of the meeting. So we're going to be asking you about uh, if you have any questions on the designation process or the timeline, either that's occurred all up to date or going forward. Uh, whether or not you have feedback on the draft design guideline framework. So specifically, we're going to present to you the intent of the design guidelines, the table of contents, and then some initial guiding principles. Uh, and then also, do you have questions on the CLA or the cultural landscape assessment process or findings um, this evening? So with that, I'm going to pass to Marcy to get into the details. Yes, go ahead, Chuck. Uh, thanks. Before we begin the discussion, I there's one thing I forgot to bring up at the beginning of the meeting. I wanted to Thank the Landmarks Board for coming to our meeting. We were unable to get a quorum of Parks and Recreation Advisory Board members to come to your meeting. I want to apologize for that and welcome you, and I uh, hope we have a very good and fruitful discussion tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Wonderful. Well, good evening, board members. Um, Marcy Gerwing. Um, so I'll give an overview of the designation process to date, which begins by looking back uh, to 2021. And Rosa, if you could go to the next slide. Um, in 2021, the city received a request to expand the landmark boundary of the band shell to include the area between the seating and the ditch. The Landmarks Board voted to initiate the designation process and in 2022 voted to recommend expansion of the boundary. 
City Council chose not to expand the boundary, but gave a nod of five for parks and planning staff to explore the creation of a historic district in this area. Next slide. At the beginning of this year, uh, parks and planning staff determined an approach to explore a historic district, including the development of a cultural landscape assessment or CLA. And on May 30th, a historic district application was submitted by three historic preservation organizations. And on July 12th, the Landmarks Board voted to initiate the designation process. <laughs> the applicants in the city signed an extension to allow additional time for the, necess the necessary department coordination and community engagement, as well as the development of the CLA. Next slide. So the proposed boundary uh, of the historic district as submitted in the application includes Central Park, the 13th Street and Sister Cities Plaza, five individually designated landmarks and portions of Broadway, 13th Street, two ditches and Boulder Creek. The boundary extends from the west side of the Muni building to 14th Street and from Canyon on the north to Arapahoe on the south and the privately owned parcels at the northeast corner of Arapahoe and Broadway uh, are not included in the proposed boundary and neither are the parcels on the north on the east side of 13th Street south of Bimoka. Next slide. In July, the Landmarks Board voted to accept the application and initiate the process to further explore the area's eligibility based on the following findings. Um, its inclusion of five significant buildings and their sites that have been previously designated, its historic significance in the history of Boulder's park development and for the role played by the Boulder City Improvement Association, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., the Lions Club and consulting city planner, S.R. DeBoer, in, and its contribution to the social and cultural life of the city for over a century. Its architectural significance that includes the uh, work by notable architects, builders, and urban planners represent, representing examples of a progression of architectural styles, and its environmental significance for its planned and natural site characteristics that represent an established and visual, familiar visual feature of the community. Next slide. And so um, moving to the project update, I'll cover the department coordination, research and engagement efforts the project team has completed since July as part of this historic district application. Next slide. There are nine city departments that manage or have purview within the boundaries of the proposed historic district. Uh, we met with representatives from each of these departments in August to provide information about the process, discuss the effects of historic designation, answer questions, and listen to concerns. We also asked for what level of involvement each department would like to have in the development of the draft design guidelines. Uh, our um, colleagues in parks and planning, uh, we've met bi-weekly um, since the beginning of 2023 mm -hmm. to coordinate efforts on the CLA in the overall project management of the historic district application. Additionally, there are reaches of two ditches within the boundary. And so we've uh, worked with our colleagues in utilities to help coordinate uh, with the ditch companies, as well as reaching out to CDOT. Um, and in both cases, uh, work within the easement for the ditches and um, CDOT of state highway wouldn't require historic preservation review if the district were designated. Next slide. So this uh, designation application provided an opportunity to fill some of the research gaps um, of the history in the area, particularly the history of the early residents and, and businesses that were displaced. We utilizes recently, uh, re utilized recently digitized information from the Library of Congress and the National Park Service and uh, other state and local sources and focused on primary sources such as firsthand accounts, period newspaper articles, maps and photographs, um, and additionally consulted local experts and contemporary secondary sources. Uh, the research was incorporated into walking tours and an online interactive story map. Next slide. Uh, the project team includes support from a community engagement senior project manager who has helped us use different methods um, in our engagement strategy. And uh, this is to share information about the area's historic significance raise awareness and understanding of the designation proposal, gather feedback from historically excluded communities, facilitate discussions from key stakeholders on draft design guidelines, 
and solicit feedback on whether a portion of the civic area should be designated as a historic district. Next slide. Uh, this is a high level summary of the project's engagement strategy, but more information is in the memo. The project team met with the community connectors and residents about the designation process and to discuss the racial equity strategies for the project, including engagement. Um, following on these consultations, the main opportunity identified by the project team to advance racial equity was to explore and build a more comprehensive narrative of our city's development by researching, elevating, and telling the stories of historically excluded populations. The community connectors and residents agreed to participate in a dry run of the walking tour to provide feedback on the script through a racial equity lens. We partnered with the applicants to provide walking tours in October, and the applicants have since translated that script into a Pocket Sites app. Uh, we launched the project website with a place to provide feedback, as well as an interactive story map detailing the history of the area. Our communication and media coverage has included a Channel 8 interview, a press release about the story map, and social media posts. We also participated in the What's Up Boulder event in September, presenting um, uh, and presented research on the area's early residents at the Carnegie Library's Boulder Rewind event. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to Shihomi and then she'll hand it back to me for the draft design guidelines. Thanks, Marcy. Next slide, please, Rosa. Okay, so I'll walk us through the cultural landscape assessment. Um, I do wanna highlight that uh, BPR has led uh, the cultural landscape assessment, the research, the evaluation in conjunction uh, with PNDS and our consultant, our historic consultant, MIG. So tonight I'll be walking you through just general process and timeline, the site area and boundary, our methodology, significance and integrity, as well as the findings from the CLA. Next slide, Rosa. Thank you. Um, so overall process, this is uh, what we sent out. It's very similar to what was included in the April IP to council, but just a timeline, an overview reminder of April to May, we really started scoping for the CLA. Um, we updated council on the two-step process that was included in the CLA. May through October, we conducted research and analysis for Central Park. This is where the CLA um, was reviewing and evaluating for significance and integrity. Uh, the development of historic periods for Central Park was evaluated, assessment of the significance and integrity within those uh, periods of significance was also conducted. October through November, development of findings of the historic boundary were completed as a draft and sent out to our historic consultant. Um, this timeline was extremely quick for a project this complicated, a lot of moving parts, about six months, usually a CLA, CLA takes 18 to 24 months, just as a reference, um, to do due diligence as well as thorough research, but we tried to stay in lockstep with our timeline and um, do as much due diligence as possible throughout it, and I think we're um, on a very good process and foot, we're delayed just by a bit, but today in December, we have our findings, the evaluation summary published in the memo with the attachment affirming the findings from MIG. January, we will come back and publish the full CLA and the consultant will be helping us um, with that publishing. So next slide, please. So I just want to walk you through and locate the study area for the CLA in blue is our boundary of research and evaluation for Central Park. You can see the already historically designated sites around us, as well as one with the band shell within uh, Central Park. So that is already a historic designation, um, but it, the research did include uh, the findings there as well for the CLA. I just want to point out, too, that our methodology uh, was very rigorous. It's defined by the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 with our criteria for National Register of Historic Places. It also includes the 1998 National Park Service Guide to Cultural Landscape Report. So we're doing an evaluation on if Central Park is considered a cultural landscape. Um, it also is in line with our local code, chapter 911 for historic preservation for integrity. 
So the first step of this, and we will walk through uh, this in more detail further on, but historic research and inventory was conducted to identify historic periods for the park. Evaluation of significance for each historical period was conducted. Following this, um, the evaluation of integrity for those periods uh, with existing conditions and landscape characteristics were evaluated, as well as the final layer, the seven aspects of historical integrity. So a lot of layers have gone through the CLA research and finding. Next slide, please. So this is a summary of findings. And what I wanna highlight here, I know it's a lot of writing up here, but we will walk through each step individually further on. But in green, as you see here, this is our uh, recommendation from the CLA findings for a historic boundary. Um, the methodology was also restated here. It just affirms what I went over uh, above. So let's keep going to keep on our time. So next slide, please. So here's where we start the process for historic periods in that blue boundary for Central Park were identified, 1903 to 1922, acquiring land for Central Park, 1923 to 1936, the Olmsted Junior design for Central Park was identified, 1937 to 1973, the Huntington DeBoer design for the band shell is a historic period recognized in the CLA as well. And 1973 to today, modern updates is a historic period included. Next slide, please. So once we have our historic periods identified in our research, step one evaluates the historic period of significance. This, excuse me, historic period for significance, meaning that you can see here all four periods we analyze for uh, the National uh, Register criteria for significance. So that is a criteria A through D and historic period one and four do not have significance. Four is the modern age. So we drop both in our evaluation, but we identify potential significance for the Olmsted Junior design period, as well as the Huntington DeBoer period. And those criteria for significance were under B, associated with lives of the person significant in our past. C, embodies distinctive characteristics or represents the work of a master. Um, as well as a firm significance for the Huntington DeBoer period. So that is under criteria A and C. So A is associated with the events that have made a significant contribution and C is similar to that Olmsted Jr. period. So we move forward to step two with these two periods that we've identified significance for. Next slide, please. And the next step is identifying landscape characteristics. So these are existing conditions out on site that we can evaluate today. Um, for both of these periods, we've identified topography, vegetation, circulation. Um, I won't read the whole list here, but those are very specific to what is out there today in both periods of significance. Um, you can see that we have three designations, no integrity, diminished integrity, has integrity. Um, so overall for the Olmsted Jr. Uh, design period, we have found diminished and no integrity due to a lot of alterations out there on site. And so overall for landscape characteristics, we found no integrity in the CLA. In the Huntington DeBoer period, we have found integrity in a lot of the original design, including all those landscape characteristics you see there. And it has, we've identified integrity. Next slide, please. After evaluating the landscape characteristics, the seven aspects we've overlaid on top of this and in the Olmsted Jr. period of significance, again, we have all three categories. The sum total has no integrity in the seven aspects. In the Huntington DeBoer period, um, we've found a lot of integrity still left today. And so this is categorized as has integrity. Next slide, please. So today, the historic preservation consultant has affirmed the findings, again, attachment in the memo that we have sent out. Um, what they're working on currently now is completing the draft of the CLA. So they find in the content of our inventory of the existing conditions, the evaluations of finding, 
and evaluations of integrity and significance, no content change. Um, but they are working to streamline the full document, formatting a few things in the analysis section, and finalizing um, some copy edits for us so that we can present and we'll publish that, you can see, in January for next steps. I think that wraps up my portion. Back to me. Yes, back to you, Marcy. Next slide, please. All right, so um, thank you. And so I'll go over the draft design guideline framework, including the process and the scope. And to start the scope as we originally envisioned it was going to be much larger with detailed design guidelines in within this process. But because of the time constraints, we've reduced it down to a framework, which includes the intent of the, de the design guidelines, a table of contents, and then the guiding principles. Next slide. So the draft uh, framework was developed with input from a technical advisory committee and then um, circulated for uh, department review. And we anticipate the framework will continue to change and look forward to your feedback uh, here tonight. If the district is designated, a separate project will begin to develop those district specific design guidelines. And then um, as mentioned previously, the Landmarks Board ultimately adopts uh, design guidelines. Next slide. The technical advisory group was comprised of representatives from Community Vitality, Facilities and Fleet, Parks and Recreation, Planning and Development Services, and Public Works Utilities, as well as representatives from the three applicant groups. Next slide. So beginning with the intent statement, or in other words, um, what's the purpose of these design guidelines? How will they be used? The guidelines will be a framework to facilitate review of proposed uh, changes within the district. They will recognize the unique character of the district and supplement the general design guidelines and clarify that if the two documents conflict, then the district specific guidelines would prevail. They'll encourage preservation and careful treatment of historically significant resources while recognizing the need for continuing adaptation and improvements and they will guide appropriate design outcomes, but not be a checklist for compliance. Next slide. And then the table of contents is proposed to include um, in the beginning, the review process, roles and responsibilities, uh, what requires review, and then a brief history of the area. And then the guidelines themselves would address, um, and I won't read through all of these, we can come back to this slide if needed, um, but these were the areas that seemed uh, necessary that were district specific that the uh, general design guidelines wouldn't address on their own. Next slide. And so the full guiding principles are in your packet and we can return to these um, during the discussion if needed. So I'll just give an overview for each. Uh, starting out with the very first one uh, would be the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. Uh, are the foundation for the historic district design guidelines. Um, the next one talks about uh, preserving maintenance access and aligning the guidelines with management practice in adopted city plans and policies as they're related to life safety um, and accessibility. Then next slide. The third one speaks to defining the district's character defining features and drawing inspiration from them, such as Boulder Creek, uh, the forward looking architectural character and the park as a place for recreation, gathering and play that should continue to reflect modern needs. Next slide. The fourth one speaks to the symbolic importance of the area and how it's critical that it uh, is an inclusive and welcoming place and uh, tells a broader history of the area. And the last one, next slide, uh, speaks to the guidance for artwork within the district and is aligned with the city's acquisition policy as well as the civic uh, area park plan. And so um, one question for you all tonight is what's missing? Is there a big um, gap here? For example, after we sent these out in the memo, um, we realized that there might be something around the East bookend that might be appropriate for a guiding principle. Next slide. Um, so we're just going to look forward through the rest of the process. We look forward to the conversation um, tonight. We will return to the PRAB meeting at your next meeting on January um, 22nd for your feedback on the overall designation proposal. And then we'll go to the Landmarks Board for a designation hearing on February 7th. 
After that, we'll go to planning board for their um, input on any land use implications. And then we'll go to city council. And because districts are designated through ordinance, we'll go twice, once for first reading, and then the second reading will be a public hearing. And those are tentatively scheduled for late March and early April. So with that, I'll turn it back to KJ. <clears throat> Thanks, Marcy. Uh, next slide, and that will just bring up our discussion questions. And maybe what I might suggest is just starting with a, a general question to the group. Do you have any questions about the presentation or information that you just received before we dive into more detail on some of these topics? So uh, when you first give your first comment, I would like everyone to state your name just so we can get to know each other a little better. Thanks. And please remember to turn on your mics when you speak. And if there are no general questions on the presentation itself, we can, oh, looks like Chuck may have a question. <laughs> As always. Um, I was curious why the you consider the, the band shell separately from other uh, landmark buildings in the area. It seems like there could be linkages among the different parts of that, that part of uh, the park that might have historical um, significance. And by isolating it, you don't, you aren't able to draw out those linkages. And I wonder, A, if there are any linkages like that, and B, is it normal practice to, to examine something in isolation like that from its other surrounding historic landmarks? I can take that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we did in the CLA process look at uh, the historical evaluation of the full park. And so we didn't isolate in the beginning in our research inventory and evaluation. We looked at the park comprehensively along with the band shell. Elliot. Thanks. I have a couple of questions just about the process. Well, two are process. One is kind of substantive of what you just presented. The first is, can you, in layman's terms, describe what integrity means? Is it something that is discernible or visible still based on the what we believe to be the historic significance of that place? Sure. Yeah, so um, integrity is the ability of a place to um, convey its history or related to its significance. So there are... Um, places that change over time, but there are uh, buildings or structures or sites that would change so much that you could no longer recognize or read that original history. And, and one example that we like to use in historic preservation, which is not scientific, but if time travel existed and the original owners or early residents could come and walk past it, would they recognize it? And it, it is a little bit more detailed than that, but it is its ability to convey its historic significance. Right. Um, thank you for that. That helps a lot. That's what I figured it meant. I just wasn't totally sure. Um, so we're talking about guidelines right now and um, principles of that. And I'm wondering when are the guidelines actually, or the design guidelines developed in relation to the quasi-judicial hearing about the designation itself? Yeah, so it varies for each historic district. And um, of the 10 historic districts that are designated, only eight have their own design guidelines. And sometimes it's really simple. Like the last district that was designated in 2008 was just two blocks and they were all residences built within a pretty short amount of time. And so the design guidelines were developed during this quasi-judicial process and adopted at the time of designation. This one's a little more complicated. Um, and so uh, our approach is to do guiding um, principles now to kind of give direction. And then if designated, start a separate project um, pretty soon after that then um, develops those, those specific guidelines. Okay, thank you. Um, and then my last question is, and maybe this is more of a question for Lucas or Allie, but so, under the charter and the um, municipal code, we can make recommendations related to um, the protection and maintenance of our parks. Um, because this has never happened, but like I don't know of any instance where these two groups have gotten together and we've had to make this recommendation necessarily in the context of a 
preservation designation. Marie, what, Lucas, if you were advising us on how to communicate a recommendation to the city council, would that be through a written resolution? Would it be through a letter? Would it just be through a voice vote of some kind? What would that look like? I think you uh... Let's see, I think, there we go. Um, I think you could do that in a couple of different ways. I mean, I think you could adopt something in writing at your next meeting. It's a little bit hard to do that, um, or it can be hard to draft things in meetings and still comply with uh, open meetings laws and that kind of stuff. You could also, well, as you mentioned, a resolution is possible. You could all vote to kind of develop a position, land on that position, and you could sort of pick a member to go speak at a council meeting or at a, the landmarks board meeting to just convey that position. I'm, I've, I've been told that city council, they sort of will draw out um, input if they feel they need it, as opposed to necessarily wanting someone to, to be proactive. I think that's probably a conversation for, that might need to take place with some of the parks and rec staff, you know, some of your light, your liaisons to figure, figure out what would be the best approach um, to do that, but I think there are some, yeah, different ways you could go about it. Okay. But I mean, have they, when was the last time that, a, a parks property was landmarked? Have there been any recently? I mean, we have the Harbeck house, right. And there's been some interaction. Um, it's been a while, especially in the context of a historic district, like Chautauqua, uh, designated in 1978. Um, there's, a couple pocket parks in the residential districts. Um, and then Columbia Cemetery was also uh, decades ago. So it's been a long time. Um, so I don't know if we would repeat what was done before, but we would come with clear a clear ask at your January meeting um, with the avenue of how to provide that feedback. Great, thank you so much. Great, other questions about process? This kind of got into the, into the process. Anna, yeah. Hi, I'm Anna Seeger. Um, so my question is, um, I saw that you got, this was the first project to use the racial equity tool to kind of um, look at the process. And so, and as well as like the, your process, which looked at um, integrity and significance. So I was wondering like if the history includes uh, displacement and erasure, like how do you, that's obviously going to affect significance and integrity. How do you handle that? It seems just like two opposing principles. I understand this area was significant to the African American community, and the KKK uh, got um, ran people or African American people out of uh, Boulder around the time that you guys uh, first identified the first period of potential significance in the 20s. So I was just wondering how that played in when you have an active effort to displace and erase um, culture and integrity? Yeah, I, I hear a couple questions within that. And, and one would be speaking to the racial equity um, tool. And I will say meeting with the community connectors in residence, um, we kind of approached it wanting to tell a more complete history and, and ask new questions. But through those conversations, it really impressed upon me how emotional history is and how language matters and how whose history we tell and how we tell it is, is really critical. And so through this designation process, there's an opportunity to elevate some of those stories that we previously didn't know or overlooked or characterized in a negative way, um, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. The second question about integrity is, um, going to the periods of significance. And so if we were looking at a potential historic district of the early residences that were there from 1880 to 1928, then we would say that part of Boulder's history, this area has significance, but because all of those buildings are gone, it has no integrity. So therefore it's not eligible for designation as a local historic district. There are other periods within um, the last hundred years of the Central Park civic area that have significance. And so then the question is, okay, do those periods, 
periods of significance have integrity? Is that able to convey its history? That being said, there are still opportunities to tell those stories and, and tell a more complete um, history of Boulder without the physical remnants there. That could be through interpretation. It could be you know, through a story map. It could be through artwork. Um, I think that's, that's an opportunity that lies ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Great question. Mr. Decker from the- I have board. a quick process question. I'm, I'm curious as to what role certain outside components of the community have played in the process up to this point, uh, specifically say the Friends of the Band Shell and Historic Boulder. Yes, so the application was submitted by three historic preservation organizations, three. Oh. Friends of the Bandshell, Friends of the Tea House, and Historic Boulder. And so um, uh, we met with them on a weekly basis in August and September to uh, develop the walking tour together and, and also help fill those research gaps. And so um, we partnered on the walking tour, um, co-led those. And then, um, yeah, had those regular meetings or so. Okay. Other questions on process or any questions about process going forward, kind of beyond Elliot's questions around how does how does Prab convey, you know, information and then the landmarks board in February, planning board in March, city council, April timeframe. Any questions about that just procedurally? Great. Um, well, why don't we move on to the next topic, which is uh, a bit more meaty in terms of content uh, and um, looking for feedback from all of you. So thinking about the draft design guideline framework, um, I would pose to you maybe just uh, initially, does uh, the overall sort of approach that staff has taken of developing, uh, developing this framework of uh, an intent statement, the table of contents and the five guiding principles, does that seem like the appropriate level of detail at this point? Do you have any additional comments on uh, areas that we should continue to look at before we maybe dive into those guiding principles in, in more depth? I'm seeing lots of head shakes and no, I'm just kidding. Um, so, uh, well, that's great. That's great. That means we've we've done our job and, and we've um, come to you and provided the information necessary. So if we do dive in then to the more detailed um, principles themselves and, and Rosa, I don't know if maybe it might make sense to flip back to those design guideline slides just so we have those up. Um, yeah, we can start with the first two on that first slide there. Um, so these really are conveying, you know, kind of an underlying basis of the Secretary of Interior standards. This is fairly commonplace, uh, you know, within our own design guidelines framework. Um, but then the second one, I think, is an important one. I'd be interested to hear any reactions from, particularly from the Parks and Rec Board, um, knowing that you have ongoing maintenance responsibilities within the park area, if that were to be included in the designation. Really, the intent behind our um, this principle here is to maintain, you know, quick and and easy access for uh, you know maintenance and other uh, particularly life safety and accessibility improvements that those would not necessarily need. Uh, in-depth landmark board review and, and historic um, preservation review going forward. So um, I'd be interested to hear if anybody has feedback or reactions to that. Ronnie. Well, um, it's just without fully understanding the implications, it's hard to know what urban trees might mean and um, park design standards, you know, I feel like, and, and I guess transportation networks to some degree, I feel like they're so foundational to what aspects of the park still have integrity. Um, and I recognize that there might be maintenance components um, that, you know, need to overlap. Um, but I guess I'd be curious 
where is that information in the guidelines? Um, and at some point, I imagine we'll be able to look at that. Everything to add, Marcy? Um, no. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm sorry. Um, so we we wouldn't have specific design guidelines in this process. This would just be the level of a guiding principle to then develop specific design guidelines. Um, but you know the the urban tree canopy. There's adopt an adopted plan about um, preservation of mature trees, but then addressing life safety. You know, which is an immediate need or when a tree is diseased or needs to be taken out. The idea here is that we, the Historic Preservation Review, are not the experts in, in these pieces. And so rather than adding another layer, look to those plans to align the design guidelines with them. Is there an effort to um, incorporate original plantings that may not necessarily be there today, but just like a tree species and plant species list um, and understand how that might apply to current tree and plant standards and include selections for moving forward? I, I think there's two of the five guiding principles that might relate to that. The first one is that the guidelines would be rooted in the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. And so that recognizes that a place changes over time versus restoration, which would be looking at a you know, hundred year old plan and saying, you know, there was this species here and this species here. Um, so we would not go in that rigid kind of restoration approach. We would be looking at how has the, um, the area changed over time and how will it continue to change over time in a way that's sensitive to the historic character? The other guiding principle that relates, and Rosa, if you could go to the next slide. Um, this one talks about the guidelines and through the designation ordinance defining character defining features within the um, historic district and potentially drawing inspiration from them. So it would be appropriate to say, what if this portion of the Olmstead Brothers plan were um, incorporated into re a redevelopment, not so much as a requirement, but more as a, a pointing to it as a potential area of inspiration. And feel free to add anything too. Yeah, I think I was just gonna add um, just to the maintenance side of it, life safety and um, what we're looking towards in terms of change over time. So for instance, for the urban tree canopy, um, we have trees out there today that we are preserving and absolutely wanna keep as old growth and also um, part of, maybe part of the original park design, but these are species that we're also, some of them are having problems with uh, modern day disease. And so we are doing a lot of maintenance and pruning for uh, safety hazard, for instance. So there are other species that we can look to that have the same overall character canopy, um, provide shade, similar features um, that we can stay within. Go ahead, Bernie. Thanks. Uh, just in more practical terms, I'm wondering, should we go forward with this, with this designation? Does anything change in the maintenance of the park? Great question. Mm -hmm. So um, the design guidelines are intended to define clearly what requires review and what doesn't. But generally, maintenance maintenance doesn't require review. It's usually the, the larger scale uh, changes that, that would. Um, and I saw Mark would like to add to that. Okay, Good. never mind. Thank you. Right. Go ahead, Abby. Um, that was a great question. I'm Abby Daniels. And first and foremost, I want to thank all of you and Allie and your team, because nearly every day of the year, I'm a beneficiary of Parks and Rec. So thank you for all you do. And we know how much you have under your purview. So we, we're not envious of that, but thank you for everything you do. You, you brought up a good question because, and, and you just said something that about 
ch the change. And I think one of the things we have to fight constantly in historic preservation is that if something is designated or landmark, change is totally permitted. And in fact, you know, it's not hard to drive through Mapleton Hill, our cherished historic district, and see all sorts of additions and things going on. But like Marcy pointed out, a key thing is there might be something that has a level of review by the Landmarks Board. And one of the most brilliant thing of um, Boulder's nearly 50-year-old preservation program is that there are weekly meetings. So a lot of things can get pushed through maybe just by staff review or administration, or we rotate in and out on Wednesday meetings and try to move things as, through as quickly as possible. So change can happen. I think there's this concept that things are more frozen in time. And, you know, Marcy, you explained that, that maintenance, you know, that that is expected. That's part of the thing. So um, change is definitely permitted. It's It just may be guided or recommendations may be given to the applicants who ask for that change. Thanks for that clarification, Abby. Chelsea, did you have something? <laughs> <laughs> you looked um, like you were leaning forward. So. Yes, I very much respect Abby and my whole, all my colleagues. But I will say that while we say that, oftentimes it is very difficult to make changes on historic property. So I don't want to, I don't want to give this false sense that it's easy to change things if it's landmarked, because I don't think based on my year and a half on this board that that is true. Other, I'm sorry, uh, other questions on, let, maybe let's dig into this principle uh, as well before we go to the next two. Are there any other reactions to um, this principle trying to reflect what some of the key features are within, you know, within the park itself that that could be drawn on for inspiration going forward? Is there anything that's missing there that we should be thinking about? Go ahead, Chuck. Could you comment on the um, the irrigation canals and their role? You mentioned the creek here, but the canals also have historic significance, right? Yeah, in the um, the reach of the Boulder Slough, I'm learning a lot of terminology through this. Um, <laughs> is the oldest built feature within the proposed um, boundary um, built it added in 1871? Um, the ditch companies have water rights in, in including um, maintenance and access, et cetera. And so uh, we're proposing that we follow the same approach as we did when the tea house was landmarked in 2020, which is to specifically call out and clarify that work within the ditch easement, maintenance, improvement, undergrounding, et cetera, wouldn't require historic preservation review because it's out of the purview of our uh, city program. And so, um, it's a recognizing its historic significance, but also clarifying that that uh, change can happen and it doesn't require review. And uh, the section of Broadway that goes through is similar, which is that we would not require or we would not review uh, any projects related to CDOT's work on Broadway. Um, I had a follow up question. Sorry, you're not on that. A follow up question on that, and I'm Ronnie Pelusi on the Landmarks Board. Um, can you share a little bit of information about when the underpass was created um, and whether or not that's part of the purview of the district? I hear what you're saying about CDOT, but is that of historic significance? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, so um, let's see. I learned through this process that the Broadway Bridge was. Um, replaced about 20 years ago. I initially thought it was historic, um, but they just did a really nice job of making it compatible. Um, and then the underpass when, in, uh, when the Boulder Creek path was established in the early 80s. Um, so, uh, sorry, was your question whether that was historic or a contributing feature? It was, and you know what involvement we might have, or the design guidelines might have on its in its location and status. I would say that uh, the Boulder Creek Path, which was added in 1984, is not quite 50 years old yet, and so it would be 
if designated a non-historic element uh, within the district. So as you know, within a district, there are contributing and non-contributing features. And so the guidelines would speak to changes in, in the flexibility for non-contributing features versus those that are contributing. Um, so from a design guideline standpoint, that might look at the type and character of hardscaping or the width or amount of hardscaping, uh, which would relate to the location. Um, but otherwise, uh, it wouldn't be a, a historic feature. Mark? Oh, sorry, John yeah. Decker. <laughs> I once knew a guy named Mark Decker. Okay. How about that? I, I, I have a question that just was generated from what I saw one of my colleagues writing here. Um, what in, in the event of something like flood induced catastrophic change to the area, is there any kind of contingency guideline or intent to put contingency guidelines for dealing with, um, abrupt change occurring at the hands of nature? Mm -hmm. And I guess an example would be if the creek radically changed its course, which it could do. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to take a crack at this one because I haven't had a chance to yet. But um, we we attempted to try to recognize the possibility of those kinds of things happening, in, particularly here where we, you know, we we clearly included the language that Boulder Creek is a living entity, right? And it's significant or significant to Boulder's past and, and has a relationship to flood conveyance and, and really just part of a natural system. Um, I don't know if we had anticipated because par partly because we haven't quite gotten that far in the design guidelines process, but I don't know if we've anticipated any sort of contingency guidelines or, or how we might offer direction and guidance for, you know, what to do next if something like that were to happen, but that's certainly something that we can consider and, and, you know, speak with our utilities colleagues to understand what, um, what types of policies they may already have in place for, you know, resiliency in, in our storm and flood, uh, storm and flood master plan. So we can look to that for some, some guidance on that perhaps. Could I add to that, KG? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. It's, it's a really good question. Uh, I, I perhaps could give an example, might be a way to think about it. Uh, when I worked for the National Park Service, we had historic districts, which often got flooded or destroyed sometimes. And it comes down to sort of ultimately three choices. Can we, let's just say the creek flooded and the band shell uh, was destroyed, which would be incredibly unfortunate, but if it was a high level flood, you'd first off look, can you actually, under the guidance of rehabilitation, you still are allowed to restore if that band shell was able, and obviously it would depend then on the how the floodplain landed and what emerged afterwards going through the guidance. And then the second option is then to say, if we can't restore it, can we put back a facsimile of it? And I think uh, in Philadelphia, the ghost house frame, I've actually forgotten which person that was for, I should remember, um, is a way to in sort of interpret what was there. Yeah. And then the last option, which is the least one you want to do, but sometimes you might be stuck with that, is can you then interpret the site to explain what was there as part of the history? So it's sort of working through that process, depending on what happens in the situation. Interesting. Okay. Thanks, Renee. <laughs> Renee, I'm Renee Globick, and um, he stole my comment. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Just note that, please. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, to just follow up with that as well, because I see a lot of um, in the utilities part is, you know, keeping these floodways clean and, you know, um, of debris and um, trees and um, roots and stuff. So I think that you've already said like that the that the the Boulder Creek we won't, and you you said Boulder Creek and you also said like Broadway, but um, for CDOT, but maybe within the Boulder Creek and the floodways and, um, you know, the ditches and stuff that the utilities get, like, they don't have to come to us, like utility maintenance. And I think you mentioned that, but in, in to do with that is also like the bridges, you know, cause if there's a flood or if the bridges are inhibited by something, 
if these are not significant now, if we state that in the guidelines so that something could be built back in a more reasonable timeline, considering what, you know, my colleague said that it didn't have to come back here to be rebuilt or to be established would be mm -hmm. something just to make it a little clearer. And that, that is the intent of the second guiding principle of recognizing the um, critical importance of the maintenance and uh, work for these life safety pieces. And then in the beginning of the document, having something that clearly specifies what requires review, because there is a difference between like a multi-year capital improvement project and an emergency repair. And those would be treated differently in terms of the review process as they are today in the code. Ronnie Plusio again. Um, I had a mapping question. I was wondering if you could pull up the sure. image that reflects that. Uh, can you, yeah, scroll up in the presentation there a little bit? There are a couple of things I kind of had questions on here, but I guess to start with the CLA, I think was identified by the blue boundary. And then um, are the orange areas outside of that the area that would complete the landmark district? Sorry, those are the existing designated landmarks, mm -hmm. but you can connect the dots with the line. Kind mm -hmm. of, we, we have a different map if you wanna see the boundary. Do you have, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. It's on slide 13. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have it here. I don't. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, okay. Rosa. Um, and I know we've seen this before, but a couple of <laughs> questions. Um, I know that Boulder Creek has been defined as one of the areas of topic, um, but Boulder Creek isn't part of the district on the west side of Broadway. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? I would say it's premature to have an analysis on the boundary. Um, this is our map based on what was provided in the application, mm -hmm. but the next phase as we prepare for the board and council review is to do a specific analysis about the proposed boundary and what our recommendation would be. Mm -hmm. So um, it wasn't intentional in terms of only having it on one side versus the other. And I guess I had a similar question and thought process about 13th Street. I'm glad to see that that was included as a topic. I'm curious to see what comes of that as you know guideline principles. It does seem to be a very important piece of the infrastructure, um, but it also initially and intuitively seems like it might want to, the boundary might want to span um, all of 13th from Arapahoe to Canyon. Yes, and I would say on January 22nd and February 7th uh, would be the appropriate time to talk about the boundary. Okay. Great, thanks. Um, I, I have one. Oh, go ahead. Can you hear Sunny. me? Okay. Yeah. Um, so maintenance has been brought up a couple times, but I haven't heard if if this is designated who, like for the band show, right now I understand Parks and Rec has to maintain that. Is that correct? So if it becomes a historical landmark and the expenses of preserving that as is become really expensive, does is it still Parks and Rec or is that shared or? Sure. Yeah, go ahead, Allie. Yeah, th Sunny, thanks for that question. And let me clarify. So the band shell has an existing landmark and the, the operations of it aren't impacted by the fact that it's protected by the historic landmark. What has changed is the process of any changes. And so a simple example is, um, several years ago, the seating was painted a more vibrant color and it went through a landmark review to say, um, and I think, I believe that was at the staff level. It didn't go to the, so there's different levels of review, the painting of the band shell seating to this red that was, um, I, I enjoy it. I think it looks very nice. I wasn't part of it, but it, it went through a landmark review so that there was professional review by the historic preservation staff to say, is that in line with 
the design and the, the, um, the feeling of this area. And so what would change if the, um, if there is a historic district is that any, any, um, projects, not necessarily the maintenance as Marcy's explained projects within the district would be governed by these guiding principles. And so it doesn't impact the maintenance or the funding of them, just the decision-making and feel free to add anything. If you can you talk a little bit about the historical land use in, in that area, like in your exploration, like what, like now we have the farmer's market, was it traditionally a, a market? We have people camping. Was it traditionally used for camping? I'm just curious what the land use is and how much of that we want to preserve and how that works in. Sure. It, yes, so um, I would um, encourage anyone to look at the story map, which is kind of a, a visual timeline that goes back uh, starting um, in the late 19th century and, and even before that. And so um, without taking too much time of the uh, study session tonight, I will say there were residences located west where the municipal building is now and there was a greenhouse and a couple other buildings in what's now Central Park. And then the um, east side of 13th Street was uh, industrial and commercial. The old gas works plant was located there. Um, but it uh, generally has been a civic use for about a hundred years. Um, and it's interesting in going back to the readings, uh, reading the early uh, reports on it or vision for it, the um, kind of municipal building uh, was envisioned as early as the 1920s, but wasn't built until the 1950s. The farmer's market idea for 13th Street, um, there was a, a written record that idea of in the 1930s, but it didn't come to 13th Street until uh, 19 early 1990s, I think here on 13th Street. So there are some interesting um, ties of current use and past use, similar with camping. Um, uh, and then there are other things that have dramatically changed, like a gas works right downtown. Ronnie Palucio again, just to piggyback on that, you did say that there would be another conversation about land use implications and mm -hmm. the history of that's very interesting. Um, can you talk a little bit about what implications you're forecasting? Well, I would say we are taking this one step at a time, but also trying to look ahead. So I'm not prepared to comment on the potential land use piece, but will by the time we go to planning board in, in February. Um, so I don't have an answer tonight. Yeah, and I'll just add in terms of process. So within um, within the code, uh, planning board is identified to review historic designation applications for any land use implications. Um, as as you I think know, you know at least from uh, individual landmark um, designation and review of projects, usually use is not under your purview. It's really the physical structure of the building or of our design of the grounds, that kind of thing. So um, just off the top of our heads, we don't anticipate any significant land use implications. But again, as Marcy mentioned, we haven't gone into that in a lot of detail, but um, ultimately we would bring, you know, any staff investigation and anything that we unearth um, to planning board and, and actually to, to, we would have that information ready for the private landmarks board discussions as well. So Well, I want to make sure that we're keeping an eye on time. We have about 15 minutes left, um, and I want to provide at least an opportunity to um, to the board members um, if they have any questions around the uh, process or the initial uh, findings of the cultural landscape assessment. So I'm still Abby, <laughs> but... Um, so thank you, and you did a great job explaining the process. So I don't have any questions on that, but just because um, I feel like I can be candid here is I don't think I 
am prepared or really would respond to findings, I think I'm more likely to really look at the completed project because I think that's where I'm really going to see the substance and the heart and soul. One of the things that I, I knew you were embarking on this, and I know a lot of time and effort went in and doing it in a very com press schedule. So thank you. But some of the thoughts that came to me, there are other communities, for example, in 1980, when the Central Park Conservancy was formed in New York to protect that park. And I realized that there really hasn't been, you know, we have historic Boulder that for almost 52 years has championed things in the built environment and Plan Boulder County has done things, especially aimed at open space and whatever. So it occurred to me that, oh yeah, there, there are parks that across this country that a group may have been formed who wore a little bit more into the historic aspects of it and the stories it told. And for example, there's a wonderful organization called the Cultural Land Landscape Foundation, which I think is 25 years old. And they even have a program called Landslide, which they can identify parks across the country that may need some help or support or, you know, and what I, what, what I've, kind of just happened to read recently accidentally was that a lot of parks go through these changes where you know parks naturally change just by virtue of of their landscapes and their plantings and what's there and and climate change and all of that but what i don't know in the cla because i'm not going to really respond to the findings until i have an opportunity to see the whole thing has there been any discussion for example in the secretary of interior standards that govern historic preservation and built buildings there is an area called um, like where there's a loss of integrity, maybe non-contributing, but restorable. And I just want to throw out there, I don't know if as this proceeds, if there's any part of a park that's sort of lost that integrity that I know you have um, identified and I know it's been peer reviewed, if that's restorable, if just for that question. And the, the other thing I will personally have to kind of work through in my mind is I think the CLA will be a valuable um, bit of knowledge for us that we've never had before, but then I'm also cognizant that like it doesn't exist or isn't currently a requirement in the historic preservation ordinance for landmarking. So I think, you know, Marcy has spoken several times about how much she's learned through this process. And I feel like I'm learning some things I never thought about because I was primarily always looking at a building and there's a lot more to it. So thank you for, you know, the, it's really going to be a thought-provoking discussion as this progresses. Thank you so much, Abby. We really appreciate it. And a lot of work did go into our CLA process. Um, and land, uh, park land can be quite a bit different uh, than a building, and especially uh, working with PNDS, so gracious to have us, you saw as one of the listed stakeholders up there among many. And so we appreciated the opportunity to be in lockstep with you on the research. And uh, do you mind if I just add yes. to that? Um, Mark, sorry, I didn't introduce myself before. Mark Davison, Parks Planning Manager. Um, no, I appreciate your comments. Um, I'd recommend the, 90, it's a great bedtime read, the 1998 <laughs> uh, Guide to Cultural Landscape Reports, and it's actually available online. And uh, we'd be happy to share a copy of that. And uh, it's actually the main writer of that was Bob, Ch Bob Page, whose colleague was Charles Birnbaum, who started the landlines and the Foundation for Cultural Landscapes. So the two of them originally worked together on developing that method and process. And um, it's a really good way to familiarize yourself with how that differs from the building process and then how the two come together. Chuck, go ahead. Oh, well, re regarding your last question here, it's my understanding we're not really supposed to discuss the findings at risk of polluting the quasi-judicial process, right? Lucas, I think uh, that as a general matter, yes. Um, questions. I mean, you can ask your question, and they can answer if possible. <laughs> I guess I, I would echo uh, earlier comments that with the without seeing the complete CLA and just having these very summary comments, it's very hard to evaluate uh, what to think about it. So, I would reserve judgment for the January crab meeting when we'll hear more about it. That sounds perfect. Chelsea, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I wanted to touch on the fourth guiding principle, 
around the social and political history and really making sure that the full inclusive history is um, represented throughout the storytelling of the park and even through some educational pieces that could be stood within the park. And I'm wondering um, if if this does not go forward with a historic designation at, at any point throughout the process, um, is that still possible to include in the park design as it goes through renovation? Yeah, absolutely. And um, in this area, it is part of our civic park plan. And one of our design principles or guiding principles that will uh, frame up design for us rather is uh, the celebration of history, historical asset. And so that in our park plan is woven throughout our design process and will be going forward regardless of if this is a district or not. Okay, that's great. Um, Because I am concerned about Olmstead Jr. being, I you know, he designed this park. He's done a lot of great things, but he's also done a lot of things that are not so great. Um, for example, he encouraged cities around the country to adopt racial covenants that for decades barred non-Caucasian people from owning homes um, and was really a leader in encouraging cities to displace poor people in order to beautify cities, which if you ask a person of color what beautification means, it means something very different from what it means as a white person. And so I just wanna be really careful as we move forward in this process to not um, commemorate and celebrate um, somebody who has a really, who has done a a lot of damage to our community. Um, Maybe not the people in this room, but people who are not in this room for other reasons. Um, So I just want to say that. Yeah, and I would just say that historic preservation isn't just about celebration. It's also about recognition and, and understanding what our community's history is. And that's both the good and the bad. And so through this process that is that ability to ask those questions, look at history in a new light, and own that part of history and recognize it. And it, it's not just celebration. I I agree. Um, and I just want to say like in the materials, Olmstead is used as a, uh, he's highlighted as one of the reasons why this park is so important. And so I guess in the materials I've received so far, it hasn't, I haven't been given the information to make me understand the full history. So that's why I always want to make sure it's clear that as a community, we try to integrate that more into not just the external policies and processes, but also the internal processes so that we all have a baseline level of knowledge and understanding of who and what we're talking about. Great, any other comments on the design principles or the CLA process? I guess Ronnie. this might be the, this is Ronnie Palucio again. Um, I also just wanted to compliment staff um, on their efforts. I think while I don't understand the full content and the outcome, um, what I do see here in terms of a table of contents seems very well thought out. Um, and I look forward to seeing what comes next. And I also just want to applaud everybody for um, the efforts that have been put in place for the community outreach component. Um, which I know that while there was limited time and staff, um, it does appear to me that it was a very robust effort. Um, And so I am appreciative of that and the collaborative experience we're having with you guys tonight. So, you know, as we continue to work together on this, um, you know, I think we will have a really great district on our hands. And I think it'll hopefully meet all of the needs of both preservation and aspects of maintenance and open space that are part of your purview. So thank you. Thanks, Ronnie. Well, if there are no further questions, we are about five minutes ahead of schedule. So I know. <laughs> Great. So what we'll do is we'll adjourn this portion of the meeting and is, is uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn this portion of the meeting. Someone like to make that motion? <laughs> no, make the motion, then someone else second. Great. Have a second? Oh, 
Oh, yeah. oh you did? Okay. She, uh, it's pre-seconded. Okay, well, during this portion of the meeting, we'll take a five-minute break so we can rearrange things and everyone can uh, take a little restroom break if they need it, and then we will reconvene at uh, 7.32. And a half. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. So
Okay, we're about ready to begin the meeting if our members can reappear. So we'll hold on just a minute until we have a quorum present. Okay, we're going to uh, go ahead and reconvene the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board meeting. And we'll begin with a, a briefing from Parks and Recreation Direct Director Allie Rhodes on the events that occurred yesterday at North Boulder Rec Center. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as this is an event that is under active and very thorough investigation, I'm gonna read to you from a, um, a press release that was created in partnership with the Boulder Police Department and our attorneys. And then I could add, add a little bit more specifically about the actions with Boulder Parks and Recreation that are not part of the investigation. Um, so Boulder Police were involved at a fatal officer involved shooting at about 4.30 p.m. Sunday, December 17th. Officers were dispatched to North Broadway after a man called 911 to report that a woman had pointed a gun at him while he was attempting to leave the park, uh, North Boulder Recreation Center parking lot. When police arrived, the woman walked away from officers into the neighborhood. The woman refused to stop or show her hands and then pulled what appeared to be a gun from her purse. The item was recovered from her hand and later determined to be a replica Beretta pistol, which means it looked and felt like a real gun, but wasn't operational. For nearly 15 minutes, officers tried to de-escalate the situation, including using less than lethal tactics that were ineffective. The shooting occurred after these efforts. Despite valiant efforts by officers and fire rescue paramedics to treat the woman on scene, she died of her injuries, and she has not yet been publicly identified. The Boulder County cr Critical Incident Team was notified immediately and will investigate the shooting. As is per policy, the two officers involved have been placed on leave with pay pending the outcome of the investigation. They and all first uh, responders involved in this incredibly sad event are in the city's deepest thoughts. We are also aware that this the same woman was involved in a disturbance inside the North Boulder Recreation Center prior to the incident. One of our Parks and Recreation teammates called police to report a trespassing after the woman refused to leave a cabana in the family lock, the um, shared bathroom area. No weapon was displayed during this interaction and police officers were able to persuade the woman to leave. We cannot provide any other additional additional at the time without jeopardizing the in investigation. Um, and now I'll switch away from this uh, press release to share a little bit more about what happens in parks and recreation. And so um, the woman had left the North Boulder Recreation Center. There had been an incident. She had been uh, she had arrived earlier in the day with a gentleman. They had both paid uh, in cash a drop in fee. They were not they did not have regular passes to the facility. Um, the woman had been inside a family cabana for quite some time. She did not leave upon the request of staff. There's a time limit for use of those facilities to ensure they're available for everyone. Um, when she didn't leave after several attempts and after several hours, the police were called. They came and the woman escorted without further in, or left without further incident. When staff were notified of the incident happening in the parking lot, luckily the Urban Park Rangers, that program um, is funded again into 2024. They are on Law 1, which is the police radio channel. They responded and two of the Rangers um, came inside to the North Boulder Recreation Center to help with the lockdown protocols. This was very helpful as on a Sunday afternoon, our staffing is light and having two folks in uniforms help with um, providing just a secure presence and information to the community was helpful. Um, we kept the building on lockdown until we were notified that the situation had been resolved, at which point folks were free to leave. What happens now? Um, there's two things. One, we are concerned about the emotional well-being of our employees. Having something happen in such close proximity to their workplace can be very traumatic and it can hit people at different times and in different ways. So the city has a lot of resources that we try to make available to our teammates. 
And then also, um, our leadership, Scott Schuttenberg and Megan Lohman, our recreation manager, will lead a debrief with partnerships and risk management and HR to make sure we learn from how the lockdown went and, and capture in our standard operating procedures what went well and then adjust where we could have done better. Um, I think that's a, that's a summary. I can maybe ask questions, but if they pertain to the details of the incident, I, I will not be able to. Uh, thank you very much for that very cogent summary. And um, I'm, I'm, I know my thoughts are with your staff members who had to go through that trauma, and um, I'm sure the rest of the board feels the same way. So please pass along our best wishes for their um, mental health. And um, I guess we'll hear more in the future about any changes to policies that, that result from this. Um, I, I would like to know how long the lockdown lasted before people were allowed to leave, if that's something you can tell us. I, I'm guesstimating, but I was first notified of the incident at about 420 by notifications, both staff and um, at the Recreation Center and Police Chief Harold. And I believe uh, folks were free to go around 450. So I think it was around a half an hour. I, I am guesstimating. I know it was less than an hour. I, okay. I believe it was about half an hour. Great. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, when you have a lockdown at the North Boulder Recreation Center, do they have to get away from, like, do you have to go to the center of the building structure or can they stay wherever they want inside the building? That's a really good question. I know Scott was debriefing with staff today, and I'm not sure if you're prepared to answer that question, or maybe we can just report back as we update the SOP. I believe we typically um, ask individuals to stay away from the front lobby area and go back towards the locker rooms or gymnasium space. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Ali. Um, the next topic on our agenda is future board items and tours. And that will be Ali again. I am gonna grab that packet item. I was toggling between screens for that. Um, one of the most relevant, I think, following up on your joint study session is just noting that the staff team will be coming back on your January agenda. I don't think, I'm. Uh, I'm, so, I'm going to take 10 seconds and take a deep breath. This situation is really hard. And unfortunately, it's the um, third critical incident like this in 18 months. So I'm going to find this item and also just take 10 seconds and I'll be right back on those items. If you like, we can move on to public participation and come back to this. Would you prefer that? That would be perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and move to public participation. Um, so if, if, unless there's an objection from the board. Okay, thank you. Uh, this portion of the meeting is for members of the public to communicate ideas or concerns to the board regarding parks and recreation issues for which a public hearing is not scheduled later in the meeting. Uh, the public is encouraged to comment on the need for parks and recreation programs and facilities as they perceive them. All speakers are limited to, to three minutes. Uh, depending on the nature of their matter, uh, they may or may not receive a response from the board or staff after delivering comments. But be assured that the board is always listening to and appreciate it appreciative of community feedback and input. And we have a few people signed up to speak. Um, I will see if I can get that list up. And um, we have uh, following people, Fran Mandel Sheets, Leonard Siegel, Patrick O'Rourke, Larry Makia, and Emily Ganyu, and uh, maybe one other person who is uh, waiting online. So the first person will be Fran Mandel Sheets. And uh, you should be able to unmute now and begin speaking. Hi, my name is Fran Mandel Sheets and I'm one of the many people that's uh, supporting the historic district application in Central Park, but I'm speaking to you tonight as an individual. I was a member of the Landmarks Board for years and, and the chair, and I also was a significant in creating the Highland Lawn Historic District in Boulder. I have lived in Boulder most of my life, raised my family here. Our kids are fourth generation Boulderites. We've been here a long time. My family has roots here and Boulder today and tomorrow is really important to us. <clears throat> what is preservation and why are we trying so hard for this historic preservation community to find a place at the table? First, preservation is not cementing history, nor is it a barrier to change. 
but we do respect significant aspects of buildings and places. Secondly, preservation is about saving places that matter. It is about having a sense of place, understanding the place where you live. It's about being a part of your community, thinking about it and thinking about making your environment work for you and for the future. It's about reasonable change. Knowing where you come from is crucial to good decisions about the future. Creating a historic district in the heart of Boulder is doing just that, trying to develop a community voice to know what we have, to preserve some important characteristics, restore and reinvest in moving forward. Giving preservation a voice is not the same as putting dots on a map at a meeting. It is meaningful community participation throughout the process. If you were to choose the most famous landmark, uh, landscape architects in the nation, it would be Frederick Law Olmsted. In the early 1900s, his office worked all over this country. He designed and managed New York Central Park and Prospect Park. He worked in DC. He designed many of the most major campuses in the country. Boulder had less than 10,000 people at, this, at the turn of the 1900s. And yet some Boulderites back in 1903 had the foresight to hire Olmsted to help direct Boulder's development. Back in 1910, he spent months here. And one of the designs he left behind is still intact in, in the heart of Boulder, including the trees, the stone walls for flood control, the view sheds, the creek, the open and natural areas. Olmsted should not be lightly disregarded. We need to ask ourselves, why is Parks Department working so hard to oppose the historic district and disregard Olmsted's work? Phase one, I don't have enough time to finish, but in essence, we need to think about this and we need to be able to answer to it because this is really important that we maintain this as an important part of, of Boulder and Boulder's history. Thank you. Thank you, Fran. Um, we'll do any feedback from the, uh, from the board and from staff at the end of, the, uh, of all the public speakers. Um, so the second speaker will be Leonard Siegel, and he's also going to speak about the Civic Area Historic District. And Leonard, you should be able to unmute now and speak. Yes, thank you very much. Hello, Parks and Recreation Board members. I'm speaking on behalf of the preservation organization, Historic Boulder, as its executive director. Over our 52-year history, we have been partners with you in the safeguarding of historic properties in city parks. Central Park is one of the most important and historic properties that you are entrusted to manage for the citizens of Boulder. And just a little bit of history. In 1900, a group of city leaders formed the Boulder City Improvement Association to improve the quality of life in Boulder. Among their actions was hiring the most famous landscape and planning company in the United States to design a series of parks, including the main one here at the crossroads of the city. I'm an architect of over 40 years I've taught design at CU Boulder, and I've lived here for 33 years. My most important point to you is that the cultural landscape assessment could use some additional information to give you a more complete picture of Central Park. To start, the boundaries set by the Olmsted design are still intact. It has integrity. All the following landscape design ideas by the Olmsteds are evident today. A pedestrian path remains running along Boulder Creek, Pedestrian access remains open to the water's edge of the creek. There are several open lawn areas intentionally created to provide the most flexibility and variety of public activities. There are groups of trees that reinforce the perimeter of the park. We have verified that many are original to the date when the park opened. There are intermittent trees intentionally located to shade the lawn areas during hot days in the park. The landscaping was designed to control views in and out of Central Park, especially to frame vistas to the Flatirons. Flood control measures that the Olmsteads designed remain intact. The irrigation ditch is unchanged just as the Olmsteads intended. The original design and use of the park remains as proposed by the Boulder City Improvement Association way back in the 1920s as the primary town square for Boulder. In my reasoning, the historic integrity of the Olmsted design for Central Park is intact. Preservationists should be part of the approvals processes when the City Parks Department wants to make improvements here in the future. 
Thank you for the chance to provide more information to your board. Uh, thank you very much, Leonard. Uh, next speaker is going to be Patrick O'Rourke, also speaking on the Civic Historic District. Uh, you should be able to unmute now, Patrick. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, a tragedy happened yesterday. So um, I'm in Canada for the month and I didn't know about it. Breaks my heart. Uh, I wanted to start by thanking Marcy and Claire and Aubrey from the Landmarks um, District or Department on an incredible job that they've done so far. The storybook or the story map that's available to the PRAB board is important and I strongly would encourage you to review it. It answers a lot of the questions you might have. Uh, I wanted to touch base a little bit about the CLA. Um, the CLA, what can I say? I dis disagree with some of the assumptions it makes, but to me, it's missing two critical points. Probably the most important one is the 14,000 years that existed between before 1880 or, or 1903, which is the period of significance. I think that's a huge miss, and I would encourage them to go back and review that time period and note it. It's noted throughout our reports and it should be noted in the CLA. Number two is the HHZ zone, the high hazard zone uh, is critical to the development of this because it encourages development along the creek that does not include buildings inside the high hazard zone. And so those two things alone should have been noted in the CLA and we only had an opportunity to review the executive summary, unfortunate, because the wealth of the information, the education that the historic Boulder has is unsurpassed in our community. And finally, the ditches. The ditches are an important element to the successful expansion and growth of Boulder. And I didn't remember seeing that included in there. The, the growth besides for gold mining and, and water and agriculture, those are the two most significant components of, of, of what went on. It was noted in the, the comments before, has Parks and Rec worked with Landmarks Department before? And what didn't come up is probably the largest project in Boulder that existed and nobody mentioned it, which was the Pearl Street Mall. The Pearl Street Mall is a four block long park. It's managed by the city, Parks and Recreation Department, and yet it's part of a 10 square block area. So I think the guidelines are pretty easy to follow and collaboration between the two departments is quite simple. And on the last note is adaptive reuse. Pomoka would be a great adaptive reuse to turn it into a children's museum. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, next up, we have uh, Larry Makia, who's going to talk about the 2023 aquatics and reservoir usage. Larry, you should be able to unmute. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Yep. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> hello, Brad, my name is Larry Makia. I've been a Boulder resident for 33 plus years and an avid user of city parks and rec services for over 20. I've been interacting with the Parks and Rec staff for the better part of the last 15. My comments this evening are to share that I was able to swim 12 times, lift weights 10 times this month alone at the various rec centers and make use of the fitness court at North Boulder Park twice. I was also able to paddleboard my stand up paddleboard twice out at the reservoir as well as get a dunk um, <clears throat> given the warmer weather we've experienced this month. Just today, I even rode my bike around the reservoir. I share these usages to illustrate the benefit that I derive from the wonderful facilities we've got here in Boulder. And I know that I'm not unique in this type of usage. BAM had our Christmas party. Boulder Aquatic Masters had our Christmas party last night. We had over 50 in attendance. It was great to see the swim community come together. And a central part of this is the aquatic and the reservoir facilities. Having spoken at a few earlier PRAB meetings throughout the year, I have a lot of comments. However, given the time of the year and some of these earlier comments, 
I'm putting aside my usual message for this month and wanted to just express the gratitude and best wishes for all that are making these amenities possible. So in the interest of the season and everything, thank you to all that are on PRAB, as well as the city staff, especially during the trialing times that have recently come to light, um, as well as putting in the hours. I know that I have not said it often enough, but as illustrated by the usage mentioned earlier, truly appreciate it. I know the aquatics community appreciates it. And I wish everyone a happy holidays and season's best season wishes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry, and same to you. Um, next up, we have Emily Ganyu, and she would like to comment on the events that occurred yesterday outside the North Boulder Rec Center. Thank you. So Emily, you Hi, should be thank able you. to- thank you. Um, yeah, Emily, <laughs> Perfect. Um, so I don't have anything particularly prepared given the, you know, short timeline of this. Um, so I want to start, I guess, by quickly acknowledging that, um, this was a very traumatic event for a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I, I could hear that in, uh, what your, I, I'm sorry, I don't know anybody here, but, um, you know, what your, your parks and rec member was, was saying at the beginning, I recognize that this is, you know, a pretty significant event, um, in terms of what happened yesterday, I want to share a little bit of my personal experience, um, because it will lead into, you know, the point of my comment, um, I live in the community right next door to the North Boulder Rec Center. Um, I'm a single mom to a four-year-old. We went out on the playground yesterday at just about 4.15. Um, as we're on the playground with another family, we're hearing an exorbitant amount of sirens going by. Um, obviously, we're very close to the street. So it's loud. It's obvious that something significant was happening, but we had absolutely no idea what all of a sudden we started hearing the shouting, the, the, the commands of the police that were being made. Um, and at that point, all of us parents turned to look at each other thinking, should we go inside? Like, is this safe? And then the shots go off. Um, again, I'm outside with my four-year-old, my fellow, you know, community members are outside with their very young children. We had absolutely no idea what was going on. All we could do was grab kids and run. So completely terrified, I grabbed my daughter's hand and I ran inside. My concern and the reason that I'm bringing this up to this meeting is, as you guys have mentioned, there was a full lockdown done at the Breck Center next door. Well, maybe not with a ton of advance notice, considering the nature of, of the situation, like that was that was done. You know what I mean? They had a lockdown. They had some kind of security. We were not made aware at all that there was anything concerning going on. So we're out with our children on the playground. And now my four year old knows what gunfire sounds like. So I really I most of the community really wants to press, um, you know, those in in power to have some sort of an alert system that they can give us, because as you said, this is the third event in 18 months and we never have any sort of alert, lockdown, warning, anything like that. And that's really, really concerning. And it's been very traumatic for, for us. So thank you. Thank you, Emily. Okay, we have a person waiting online who'd like to speak. They did not sign up using the process that we have established for speaking. So I wanna ask the board if someone would like if we think this person should be allowed to speak? If so, someone would uh, need to make a motion to permit the online waiting person to speak. I make a motion to permit the online waiting person to speak. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, so Rosa, we will go ahead and allow the person waiting and that person is Lynn Siegel, is that right? 
So Lynn, I think you should be able to unmute now and begin speaking. Um, first of all, I prefer to speak to the board, not to a timer. I don't know if we have that capability. Um, please proceed speaking as the other members of the public have done. Please don't start the timer until you resolve this. I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you said. Please don't start the timer until you resolve this. Your time is the ticking, you have it. two and a half minutes. Two nights ago, I testified and the pop did it. They took one of their video windows and used it differently. I don't address timers, I address boards. Okay, if you prefer not to speak, we will uh, close your speaking session. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, at this time, is there any feedback from the board or from staff on the comments that were heard during public comment? I do. So one of the commenters um, suggested that the Parks and Rec Department is somehow working against the proposed um, historical de designation. And I thought um, I'd give, I'd like to hear from staff to see if there's any response to that. Yeah, thanks, Elliot, for asking that question. Um, I've heard that comment. Also, I've seen it in emails that um, the Parks Department is wanting unfettered access to make changes to the civic area. I I've tried to dispel those comments. They're deeply concerning to me. Historic preservation is um, one of the um, tenants outlined as a city value in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Historic preservation, as Shihomi mentioned, is a guiding principle in the civic area plan. Um, and so, of course, with our colleagues in PNDS, we're working to make sure that city process guidelines and then the practices for cultural landscapes and historic designation are followed. Um, we're not working against any designation. I guess I would add that I've never seen any indication from city staff, any of our prior discussions or meetings about this, uh, suggesting that there is any such uh, motivation on the part of staff or, or, this, or this board. So I, I think we wanna see a transparent process. And I think what you saw tonight is indicative of the kind of public discussion we wanna have about it. And then Mr. Chair, if possible, I would, I would love to speak to Ms. Guayu, um, Emily. Ganyo, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll stick with Emily and I'm sorry for not catching your last name. Um, thank you for much um, for coming to a board meeting on a Monday evening. I heard that you have a small child and I heard how terrifying that had to have been to you. Um, we do, I, I will we'll debrief with the police department and see what there is a wireless alert system. It, it is being worked out. There've been kinks to it. It casts um, warnings incorrectly sometimes. Uh, and so I suspect there may have been an issue with using it yesterday, but I'll pass along. And I'm so sorry that you had that experience. I'm certain it was traumatic for you and your child and your other community members. The other thing that we can do is that we are close partners with um, several of the, the nearby neighborhoods. And I'm not sure how our, our SOPs can incorporate in a rapidly evolving and dynamic situation like that. I, I hate to make promises, but if there's any way that we can contribute to alerts, we'll certainly explore it. Great, any other feedback or comments from the board or staff? Well, I'll also just note, I sure appreciate Mr. Kia's um, nice comments and I'm glad he's enjoying the system. Me too. Okay, uh, where were we? We are on future board items and tours, so we'll pick back up with that and then we'll move to the consent agenda. Yes, thank you so much for your grace. I think the most important uh, thing that I want you all to see is that today applications opened up for boards and commissions. We for sure have one seat on the PRAB and I'm sure you share my interest in having an excellent community member who can um, fill Mr. Brock's very studious, smart and compassionate shoes. Um, the applications are open through the end of January and you all who have gone through the process um, know what it takes. And also, I, I believe shortly this week, you'll be getting some input from the city manager's office on the board and commissions process. And we know there can be barriers to applications and we appreciate your support and anything we can do to reaching wide and deep in the community and making it accessible to folks. Um, the other thing I'll note that your January meeting does have, there's a question mark, but we will be coming back to you again with part 
partners in planning and development services to talk about um, the civic area design guidelines so that your feedback can contribute to the landmarks board uh, hearing February following by council's uh, consideration of the application. Um, we'll have prepared for you, it just happened Thursday, but we had an incredible study session with city council on the civic area and we'll uh, share with you a follow up on that come January. You'll get your first look at the findings of the court system plan. We're very eager to talk to you about pickleball and tennis. We know that's been a long time coming. Uh, and then through January and February, we'll do a couple of things we do every year. We'll share with you our priorities and work plan for the year. And then we'll also share with you our 2023 progress report. So a lot of good work ahead. Thank you in advance as always for your time. Um, can I ask just a follow-up question on the kind of planning over the next couple of months. So during this past joint session, we talked about how the PRAB needs to, in some form, provide feedback or a recommendation, if we choose to do that, to city council. And I would just ask that staff consider um, when that should be and what form that should take. And if we need to have multiple meetings to review something, um, and what you would all, what you all would recommend in terms of like, if it's a resolution or some sort of vote where we share our thoughts and then delegate to one person and what the timing would be for that. And that that's incorporated into the planning process. Yeah, we'll consult with the attorneys. Um, and, and I have to review the timeline and I'm looking over at Brad to see if he knows off the top of his head, the date of the February landmarks board meeting. Are they the, the, they're out a Wednesday or a Tuesday, the timelines are going to be tight. And so right now, what I'm thinking is that you're probably going to want to capture the spirit of your conversation. We can try as staff to capture summaries and bullets, and then those can be passed similar to what we did when you, um, what did you all just approve that went to city council, the flat irons golf course lease. I said, you know, you all voted to approve. And then I said, here's what I think is the summary of your comments. This is what we will pass to city council. And you all did a, a um, gave us approval for that language. That's one way to do it in real time. What complicates it is if you all want to write something and then have to, because to have everyone review that does require additional meetings and conversation. And so you might under matters from the board later tonight, have a conversation to give us some input on what you think your preference might be. Um, and, and to inform that conversation or matters from the board, I can, I can think right now there's about three ways that you could do that. So. Okay. There are no further comments on future board items and tours, we'll go to the consent agenda. So before we discuss the consent agenda, we need a motion to approve it. So would someone please make a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. And a second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. So the consent agenda uh, is comprised of the, the minutes, the updates from Director of Parks and Recreation, the uh, planning, design and construction updates, and the park and recreation operations updates. So let's start with the minutes. Is there any discussion or changes to the minutes that are required? Okay. Uh, updates from the Director of Parks and Recreation. And I believe, Ali, you usually give us a presentation here? No. Not typically. Are you trying, are you being funny? <laughs> there's there's typically no presentation. There's a whole lot of information yeah. here that our it's, team it's in the prepared. Packet, yes. we're, we're here for questions if you have any. That's right, thank you. It's been an interesting meeting and a little, I'm, I'm a little out of sorts. I join you in that. We'll get through it together. Um, I just had one comment and I guess a question. So the, first of all, I appreciate you including the two photos, the before and after or the before and now of the reservoir um, related to the ANS and how that's impacted. I think their picture you know, says a thousand words. And I think that... <laughs> certainly is a good illustration of that. Um, can you give just a high level update on, you know, realistically, what, where are we on controlling this and, you know, what are our prospects? Cause this is a really alarming um, photo. It's, it almost has changed the color of the, of the reservoir in some areas. And, and what is the effect on our water uh, intake and quality? 
I'm going to let Deputy Director Scott Schuttenberg take this one. He's working closely with Stephanie Monroe, the Regional Facilities Manager, and then our Utilities team. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, we really don't have a solid answer quite yet. Um, we are working, um, as you read in the uh, consent agenda there, we are working with an RFP um, to try and uh, hire a consultant to come in and give us a, a plan of attack and how we're going to address the ANS issue that um, is growing very quickly. Um, we know it's going to be extremely impactful. We're looking at um, Northern Colorado Water is a, a, a big player in this. Uh, water quality is certainly first and foremost uh, extremely important for our community. And so um, the recreation side of things is, is also an important component. Um, and, um, and we know we need to be very, very aggressive, but we also need to um, make sure that we're following all the um, uh, proper channels to, to, to treat this effectively. So there's a few options out there that we're currently aware of. Um, they have a, a small boat that can work as a lawnmower to cut this down and, and strain some of the um, some of the particles out of the water. That's a, a possibility. Um, there are uh, other more aggressive chemical treatments and whatnot that we don't think are, are um, feasible, but we've hired this or we are hiring a consultant to give us a, a plan of attack. We don't know what the cost will be. Um, it, it may be something where um, it's going to take several years to, to treat this. Um, I would imagine um, our plan would be how are we going to address this in the first five years? Um, and then from there, we'll, we'll have to readdress and see where we're at. I wish I had solid answers for you. Uh, we're, once we have uh, the consultant hired and a formalized plan from them, We'll bring that to you and, and share uh, what we can uh, at that time. We just don't, we don't have it yet, but we know based on those pictures, it's extremely serious and, and we need to address it head on right now. Great. Thanks so much. I would just ask that when we have more information on this, um, I would personally like to see just as an individual board member of a full segment of our meeting be dedicated to addressing this because I feel like this is pretty serious. Um, and I would just, I'm fascinated by um, what options are out there um, to address it. Absolutely. We'll make sure to, to get this on the agenda as soon as we have information. Are there other nearby towns or other towns in Colorado that are dealing with this or successfully dealt with it? Uh, there are. Um, this is unfortunately a, a fairly common problem um, across the country, not just uh, here in Colorado. And so um, I will say that um, depending on the water usage, that, that um, correlates to how we're able to treat it and how aggressive we can be with, with trying to control it. So ours is a water supply that's consumable water, so that makes it a little bit more complex. Um, than some other communities are dealing with. So again, once we have information um, per Elliot's request, we will make sure to have a full presentation um, and, and share the, the plan of uh, action. And I, I would add that it, it increases my concern in our aquatic nuisance species mitigation protocols because the milfoil is not in surrounding waters or canals or streams to our knowledge. And testing and how I got into the reservoir is still a mystery. And that's really a concern because we also want to keep the snails out and the mussels and everything else. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we see this as uh, our top priority out there at the, at the reservoir. We want boaters to continue to be able to recreate. And, um, and we are not sure how um, the contamination entered the reservoir but we'll continue to do that research and, and present once we have more information for you. This may, this may be another question that you want to address later, but can, I would love some more details about what the danger is both in terms of to the ecology of the local ecosystem, but also in terms of the drinking water. Absolutely. Those are the same questions that we're asking right now ourselves. And, and um, again, as soon as we have information, we'll share that. Uh, Jason, I just want to check in with you and make sure we're not leaving you in the dark here. Check if you have any questions. 
No, I'm good. Thanks, Chuck. I actually had a similar question to all of you on the on the pictures, but thanks for, for raising those. Appreciate it. Okay, good. Uh, so any questions about the planning, design, and construction updates or the operations updates? Okay, great. Uh, we have no action items. We have no matters for discussion information. Uh, we do have matters from the department. We have uh, information on the Play Boulder Foundation. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Angie Jeffords, and I'm the executive director of the Play Boulder Foundation. And I'm here tonight to tell you a little bit more about what we do, how we collaborate together, and, and why it's important for us to be working together. Um, but first, I'd like to say that my heart is breaking for our community. I've been a member of the community since the 1970s, and um, my heart goes out to the loss of life, the neighbors, the staff, the parks and rec folks. You know, it's just, it's, it's tough, and um, I want to do whatever I can personally or what our organization can do to support um, whatever needs to be done to the park, so to the community. Um, so I am very excited to be here to tell you about the work of the Play Boulder Foundation. We were also created in the 1970s, and uh, we started out as a, getting our 501c3 charter uh, as the Boulder Parks and Recreation Department's foundation, so Boulder Parks and Rec Foundation. Um, over time, we evolved. Well, this is an important part, too. Um, in the beginning, PRAB was the govern governing body of the foundation. And you all would meet, or your predecessors would meet, and you'd have your board agenda, and then you would close out your agenda, and you would reconvene as the board of the foundation. And then you would do about 10 minutes worth of work. There wasn't a lot going on back then. And that, that's how it went on. And then over the years, the leadership in the Parks and Rec Department realized there was a lot more potential and opportunity for a foundation to be partnering um, with Parks and Rec. And so uh, it was determined by the PRAB board that they would separate, that uh, the, play, the then Parks and Rec board would become the Play Boulder Foundation over time. And it would uh, have its own board of directors, its own staff, its own budget and um, would begin to actually do programming and work in the community um, with the intention of enhancing the programs at the Parks and Rec Department. Um, so in that time, I'm doing a fast 30 years of history, we uh, find ourselves in the last about seven years um, really creating a true organization with um, pillars that support the work. And so we have three pillars um, that we uh, do our work through um, placemaking, environmental sustainability, and access. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we work together in each of those categories and maybe do a little storytelling at the end if I still have time left. Um, so the placemaking is kind of where the organization, where the 501c3 started with the city. Um, we uh, were able to help uh, assist in getting grant funding and doing some donor um, fundraising, that sort of thing. And so that was really useful in the beginning. And then um, over time, our placemaking category has really uh, been enhanced to donor stewardship, grant making, um, working with park enhancements, improving our green spaces. And we've worked on projects like uh, the Boulder Reservoir, Scott Carpenter, Chautauqua Park, and um, we're looking to working with Violet Park this year and have actually already secured some joint grants in the movement toward the, the, the process there. Uh, and then we also do that in the area of the EXPAND program and the YSI program as Parks and, Run, Parks and Rec Run programming um, for people with disabilities and uh, under-resourced youth. That's where our access pillar had started. Um, over time, and, and we mostly use those functions. So then we were able to move into our play pass program, acquiring a city health equity funds grant that allowed us to do a little bit more than the resources that the parks department had for funding opportunities for recreational activities for under-resourced youth. 
And that's been a fantastic, successful program. We have over 500 children apply, families apply each year, looking for, op looking for the opportunity to do some sort of recreational activity. We're also able to provide them opportunities with service providers that might be outside of what the Parks and Rec curriculum has to offer. So we have um, aerial work and dance, and um, we work with women's wilderness and other kinds of programs so that kids are really able to integrate into the community in a variety of ways and be supported in doing so, both with funding for uh, play pass vouchers that we provide funding for, and then also for um, language and cultural access to the programming. So that's that's been an excellent program this year. To date, we've this particular year, we've funded over 200 play passes, we have over 24 service providers, and we've realized that we still have a couple hundred kids on a wait list, just waiting to be able to get out and do something in the community. And so we have developed with several service providers some free and unique clinic opportunities to be able to do something to experiment, to explore their, their world uh, and we've been coordinating with uh, organizations like CrossFit Sanitas, Women's Wilderness, um, and several other groups to develop an opportunity for those kids sitting on the wait list and through our entire program to get out and do more. So we're beginning to expand those resources for the kids. Um, then we have our environmental sustainability um, pillar. And of course, right now, that's been um, just booming this last year has been amazing. I think um, the community's response to working uh, within natural climate solutions as an opportunity to fight, fight climate change um, has really energized our community. And I think a lot of people are behind it and we're finding that they're really excited about the programming we're doing. The specific way that it really complements what Parks does is that they primarily, well, they, as you know, work with city public properties. And we have the ability to work with private properties. Over 80% of the Boulder area is private property. And so we're able to really expand and care for and build on our urban canopy beyond the barriers of the city designations. Um, and so that's been a great way for us to partner. We work with forestry very closely. They have a small department as well. So putting all of our teammates together has really helped us to accomplish much more in the community. We've planted this year alone over 1,250 trees. We've engaged over 20, 225 volunteers. We've attended over 30 um, public events to talk about climate action and natural climate solutions specific to expanding on our urban canopy. Uh, so that's, so we've, we've done a lot this year. Um, one of the things that I think that the tree trust, the, the environmental sustainability piece of our work is able to do because of the energy behind it right now is engage the community and find ways that we can all work together uh, and then expand on the work. And then hopefully those threads will weave through all of the programming that we're doing, um, both as the Play Boulder Foundation and as a partner of the Boulder Parks and Rec Department. Um, there's my storytelling. Do I still have a few minutes? Um, so we have three really exciting programs right now that were, um, I, I think really exhibit that community build. And so the first one I wanna talk about is a community forced we're still developing the name Community Urban Forest is one name that we're uh, playing with. And it basically is combining um, Boulder Valley schools, the parks adjacent to the schools and the neighborhoods around the schools and the parks to engage in working to build and care for an urban forest. And we have three schools picked out right now. The first one we're gonna be working with is Fairview. And uh, we have done some training with some other schools. We've done a tree tender um, experiential training for students. We've got their youth clubs uh, developing and designing and working with the CU environmental design program students on creating this urban forest. We um, are working on the fundraising that it'll take to plant the trees and to, to build the forests, working with our Cole Boulder partners to find places that we can um, care for and promote more than just the planting of the trees, but working on the soils and the 
pollinators and the environment that will be a part of these forests. Uh, so this is very exciting and I'd love to talk more about it if anyone has any questions or wants to reach out after this. Um, we will, um, so it's, it's very exciting, bringing everyone together. Then we have another program that we've uh, been proud of the last year and we're doing again this year, and that's a, a collaboration with the University of Colorado Athletic Department, specifically in the um, basketball area, and we have Trees for Threes. And as it stands right now, one of their corporate sponsors is PepsiCo, and PepsiCo essentially purchases a tree for every three points, three pointer, uh, the men's or women's teams um, make during the season. And so last year we were able to raise nearly $8,000 in three pointers from PepsiCo. We planted trees on campus with a whole bunch of different athletes and students around campus. Um, we've been able to contribute some trees to some low income, low uh, canopy areas, helped provide our neighbors in Louisville with some trees um, for the survivors of the Marshall Fire. Um, so that funding and that relationship has again really pulled the community of the university with Boulder, with Parks, and with the Play Boulder Foundation. And we really look forward to um, this next season. And so far, I think we are going to be making a lot of trees in Boulder from the, uh, particularly maybe, but not totally the women's basketball team. So go girls. Um, we also, by the way, have a, because of that relationship have created, um, there's an intern, a young woman who is on the team, on the women's basketball team. And she's going to organize some of her teammates. And as soon as their season uh, calms down, they're going to provide a free clinic for the play pass kids to be able to have an opportunity to meet and greet and do some moves and, and be able to explore um, what it's like to be a college athlete. So we're really excited about that. Yet another thread that sort of that moves through the organization. And then finally, um, we have a new relationship with Avery Brewery. We've done a couple of things with them over the years, but um, I had a gentleman reach out to me, a staff member from the brewery about a month ago, and his son had recently passed away, very young, in his late 20s. And they were trying to think of a way to honor his son and, and the father and son have done a lot of brewing together over the years and that's where they got creative and so and he was also very interested in the environment. And so they so the father has created a beer called heavens eight and they have just recently tapped and released the beer and for every beer sold. $2 comes back to the Play Boulder Foundation. They're also doing roundups and other fundraising activities, but the, the end point is they want to plant trees. They want to have a place that they can uh, share with the community, the spirit of, in their very personal way, their son, but also um, the spirit of community. And that's very much what their company is, is believes in and really wants to do. So the first thing that they've done, and they've already raised over $8,000. And I think about 6,000 of it is slotted for the community urban forest at Fairview. So the trees will be planted. Um, so we're very excited about that. We're also going to help work in the gum barrel area um, by Avery to plant some trees. They're going to do an independent um, tree tender training. So that partnership is yet again, I think, an opportunity that Play Boulder has to enhance the work of the city recreation department um, by, by having more time and capacity and the ability to pull that in and really the function to do that kind of thing so that we support the basic fundamental needs of a good parks and recreation program. So those are our pillars. Um, I don't know if you have any other questions or, or thoughts. In terms of action from you, um, we're always looking for good board members. So, you know, we're here um, to really think about us in terms of collaboration. You're the advisory for the Parks and Rec Department and we're the philanthropic partner for the Parks and Rec Department. So if you have an opportunity that you see and you feel like it's something that Play Boulder Foundation can help enhance and expand on, you know, give us a call. Let's see how we can work because I, I think 
it would be wonderful if we were really all working as a unit um, to further the, the goals that we all have for the community in this area. Uh, so I, we would very much like that. And certainly in the uh, summer, you can buy a duck and um, join us for our fundraiser, the Great Boulder Duck Race, which we also get to include our emergency responders at and have a great time. So there are all sorts of ways to get involved and, and or a tree tender. I have a feeling there's at least one tree tender on this board. So <laughs> look out in March, we're going to be uh, running another program. Thank you very much, Angie. Um, I'm, I'm currently a board member, a recently added board member to the Pay Boulder Foundation. It's a great organization. As a philanthropic organization, they can go after money that the Parks and Recreation Department itself cannot. And they can also serve people who are not within the city limits of Boulder. So it really sort of expands the reach of some of the programs beyond just the city borders. It's a really great, uh, really great organization. And Angie's done a great job of re-energizing it after COVID really hammered it in, in a very bad way. So it's, uh, they have a good staff now and, and a lot of energy and more money is coming in and they're helping more and more kids play sports in the Boulder area. So I highly recommend learning about it, getting involved, buying some ducks for the duck race. Any way you can help would be appreciated. Thank you. Any uh, questions for Angie? Hi, Angie. It's, this is Anna Seeger. It's good Hi. to see you again. Um, I just wanted to thank you for all the work that you've done with the on the access portion. Well, I mean, everything that Play Boulder is doing, but particularly on the access portion. I know that Play Pass is a is a resource that a lot of families really appreciate. Um, and I learned that your new round is open here in December, and I sent out notifications to a whole bunch of families. Uh, the Spanish dominant families, low income Spanish dominant families from Muni Hill. And many of them said like that they were really happy to learn that there was a new round of funding. So thanks for all you're doing. Thank you for that comment. And I also um, forgot to mention that we just recently have added a young um, bilingual bicultural intern to the program. And she and our program manager, Greta Sandberg, have been actually boots on the ground going into the manufactured home communities and some of the other communities around town to just in person, like meet and get to know people, let folks know where we're at, find out what they need, listen, and then, and then try and develop these programs and these extension programs that I was talking about earlier um, to really meet the need and not just what we think they need. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's been a, a change since, since we've talked. And um, we also attended, uh, upon your advice and others, to uh, several of the family community events throughout the summer um, just to participate and to learn and to be there and to show a presence and um, continue to support the, the work and the programming. So I'm really excited about that work in equity and that will actually carry over to the, the work that we're going to do with the Tree Trust as well so that we're really finding a way to get into the community and, and, and listen and learn and then develop. That's really exciting to hear. I'm glad you're hearing, adding the Spanish language uh, liaison to your group. Uh, is there any options or um, opportunities for the uh, swim programs ah. for <laughs> you and me both? <laughs> if I could only get a swim program, we have so many kids that join uh, play pass that really want to swim and, you know, their families really want them to swim. It's a survival need. And so we would love to excellent example of where could we collaborate if we could build something with with the ideas of prab and the work of the parks program in into you know an opportunity like that we are really ready to go on that as soon as we can figure out how to make it happen so um, please continue to remember us and we continue to look um, we we need to have these kids know how to swim and we're going to discuss that on our retreat in February, right? Right? Right. <laughs> <That'd be great. laughs> Any further questions for Angie? I just want to also th thank you so much for what you're doing. The programs are super exciting and it's just 
it's really nice to hear what's going on and feel the passion behind it. So thank you. Thank you. It's exciting and fun work. <laughs> Mr. Chair, can I chime in with just a note from uh, on behalf of Boulder Parks and Recreation? Play is important, not just because they can provide that philanthropic 501c3 avenue for folks willing to donate, but they provide additional capacity around not, you know, services that we can't provide and connections to the community that, that are beyond our resources. The ability to have a partner um, but a partner led by Angie, the timing is so amazing. If you're paying attention um, to not just the federal government, but just across the country, trees are having a moment and the funding opportunities um, and they're ready for it. They're, they're waiting with their arms open. They're partnering with, with our team in the forestry, with the climate initiative staff. Uh, the tree tendered program is amazing in the way that they led by Angie and really just Angie's ability to create connections and opportunities. It's wonderful. And I'm so excited for what's coming. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Angie. Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for hanging in on a long meeting to get to your chance to speak. Appreciate that. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, next, we have matters from the board. So uh, first is the view of the final PRAB handbook um, and the introductory letter to it. So thank you, Elliot, so much for doing all the legwork and putting that together, getting it reviewed by the legal department of the city and um, ending up with a handbook that I think is very, very well done, very clear and concise and everything we want in a handbook. Heather, so I'd like to ask if there are any comments on the content of the handbook, any, any issues with it? And we you know we passed it last meeting. This is the final version that's going to go out. Um, I do have a change for the letter. Uh, somehow in the letter, I became the president. And I've always wanted to be president, but, you know, not of the board. I think I'm chair of the board. So if we could get that changed in the uh, letter that, that uh, is in the front of the handbook, that would be great. Other than that, I don't see any issues. Great. Uh, I just want to comment. Uh, thank you, Rosa and staff for um, finalizing this and putting the links in and the logo. I think it looks great. Thank you. I agree. Okay, next we have PRAB Matters. This is an opportunity for members of the PRAB to comment on any uh, interaction they've had with the public or any other issues or matters uh, regarding parks and recreation activities. Um, I and others that I have spoken to are lamenting the loss of the porter potty at the Pleasant View um, facility. Because of the end of the sports season? Well, this is the first year it's disappeared. Like a lot of runners use that um, porter potty, and this is the first year it went away in the wintertime. I'll look into it and we'll get back to you. It's, it's inside the fence, right? There's some, there, yeah, there's two inside the fence, but there's one outside the fence that's near like the shed where the maintenance workers mm -hmm. work. Oh, okay. We'll look into it and get back to you. Um, I also have a bathroom related question. Uh, so I'm wondering what are the uh, hours when the bathrooms are open at Scott Carpenter for the public who are at the playground? I know that when the pool is closed, Clearly. Yeah, I mean that the the bathroom adjacent to the playground is open year round. I believe it's nine ish to six ish, dependent upon the ability of the. We have security contractors that go around lock and unlock. I can follow up. That may not be specific. Is there a was there an issue or a thing that I should look into specifically? Um, I mean, I was at the park with my son on Saturday. I think it was either it was Sunday. It was it was yesterday, um, and the bathrooms were closed. Do you know what time it was? It was around um, 10 a.m. Okay. Thanks for the input. We'll look into it. Thanks. Great. Go ahead. Uh, just on the way down here this evening, I noticed that on the, okay, coming down the 
on the Arboretum, on the bike path, as you approach the creek on the south, I guess the south bank, south bank of the creek, there's a new chain link fence with signage that says open excavation. I'm just wondering what, what work is going on in that location. And by the way, there doesn't appear to be any work happening yet, but there's all this construction signage up. You're about to see my kryptonite and that I can't picture the spot you're talking about without looking at a map. So Scott's laughing. They're all laughing because I draw and pull up pictures constantly. So we're just going to go on a walk real quick. So we're coming down the Arboretum. We're passing the high school and we're, we haven't crossed the Creek yet. Just before you cross the Creek. And it's, tell me where you're seeing the signage. Is it right on, in front of you? On your front and to the left. Um, uh, I'd up, have to. Up oh, against the Creek. Yeah. So there is, I, I am aware there is a parcel adjacent to the Creek and between it's a little triangle. It's called pizza parcels. Um, the, I'll, I'll look into the signage. That area has been closed for quite some time for restoration. It's been, it's been several months. Um, Isn't that where the fire happened? There's a, there's been a couple of incidences. And so we needed to remediate some irrigation that the signage is confusing to me, but I do know the fencing has been in, in place for a little while. And there, there is a project coming. We had to wait. I, I don't know if they're waiting on a valve or parts there. I can look into it and get back to you. Okay, anything else? Anything from you, Jason? No, I'm good, Chuck, thanks. I'm actually just testing to see if you're still awake, so. Yeah, no, I'm still here. I'm, I'm ready for any needs around me, Chuck. Oh, uh, you're great, man. Okay, if there's, uh, our next Pratt board meeting will be at 6 p.m. January 22nd. Hopefully we'll see everyone there. Chuck, I have one thing to add as well. You will be seeing a calendar invite from me for February 5th, and that's going to be your study session. For February 5th. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, nothing else from the board. At this time, I will um, consider a motion to adjourn the meeting. Motion to adjourn. Second. Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you all very much.